Hello, welcome to the Monday, March 6, 2017 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Xavier looked at some recent malware and found that the malware doesn't use standard image hosting sites to load its images from, at least for one of the images. It was using an unsuspecting third-party site that just happened to have the right progress bar image that this particular malware author liked. This can have some bad repercussions for the site hosting the image as it may show up now in various threat intelligence reports as an indicator of compromise leading back to the site being blocked. Really unfortunate if this happens to you and not uh, terribly much you can do about it. You can prevent some of this deep linking by looking for referrer headers and blocking any foreign for referrer headers from your site. But then again, remember, referrer headers aren't always sent. So you have to at least allow for requests that don't send a referrer at all. And if you would like to learn more about analyzing malware, in particular deobfuscation, DDA put together a nice example of an obfuscated malicious document. In this case, additional characters were used to pad and obfuscate the malicious code. DDA will show you how to remove the padding characters and how to reverse the embedded PowerShell script in this particular case. Also interesting, but not really new, that the script uh, does take advantage of the event viewer exploit to bypass UAC. And as a reminder, it's not just Adobe's PDF reader that is vulnerable. Fox IT has a patch for its fandom PDF and PDF reader product. So in case you use these products to evade Adobe exploits, make sure you patch it soon. There have certainly been exploit in particular against the Fox ID PDF reader in the past. And Google's SHA-1 collision has been put to use to create matching executables that can be transmitted undetected via BitTorrent. BitTorrent splits file into junks that are verified using SHA-1 hashes. So this makes BitTorrent an attractive target for this kind of exploit. Now, when you create a harmless and a malicious binary using the shatter attack, it's possible to transmit the malicious file and have it mistaken for the harmless one. In order to pull this off, uh, the collision hashes have to align with the start of the chunk. The authors of this particular blog post actually put together a tool to make this easier. And later the code will check which one of the collision data blocks are included and then will execute either the malicious or the benign code based on this block. Essentially, the trick for all of these collision attacks is that we have now these two blocks of data with the same SHA-1 hash. So you can add either block to an existing binary and receive the same hash. The problem, of course, is that the existing binary is still the same. So within the existing binary, you do need some kind of check that will verify which block was included and then different code is executed. Of course, in particular with a BitTorrent distributing the download among many servers, an attacker could offer the compromised block of data from some of these servers, making detection difficult because other servers will deliver the harmless block of data. And then of course the malware will not execute. One way to detect modern malware is by monitoring memory and scanning for malicious executable code that malware may have loaded. However, constantly scanning memory for malware can cause quite a substantial performance hit. So in order to lower the load on the system, memory scanning often limits itself to parts of the memory that are marked as executable. 
A new technique to evade memory scanning takes advantage of this by marking the memory used by the malicious code as non-executable as soon as it finishes executing. This technique of course requires a small stop outside the memory area that will then enable and disable the executable flag for this particular piece of memory. Detecting this stop of course is possible but difficult as it's rather small and of course can be written in various forms. And Synergy is a pretty cool application that allows you to control several computers using the mouse and keyboard connected to one of them. The application comes in a free version that doesn't encrypt traffic and a for a pay version that uses SSL for encryption. A new blog post outlines several ways how a client running Synergy can be compromised if the unencrypted version is used. The pro version is not so easy to compromise. The user will see a warning, so it's up to the user then of course to recognize this warning as for what it is uh, that there is a bad SL certificate and someone is trying to play man in the middle. Well, and that's it for today. So thanks again for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.